Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for the What is the Housing Element Opportunity Dialogue. My name is Lara. I am the Program Manager at Build It Green. And to get us started, I would like to have us do just a quick icebreaker in the chat. It's a pretty big group, hard to do full group intros, but would love to know uh, just a tiny bit about everybody who's here and just get us a little warmed up. Uh, so the icebreaker is two parts. One is, what is your favorite holiday? And feel free to drop the emoji of your choice that matches that holiday. And the second part of the icebreaker is, what is your interest or connection to housing elements, the topic of the day? Uh, so please feel free to drop your responses to those in the chat. For those of you just joining, we are just doing a quick little icebreaker in the chat. What's your favorite holiday and what is your interest or connection to housing elements? Awesome. Welcome, Paul. Thanksgiving. Love having the whole family together. It's awesome. Janae, Halloween, just in time. <laughs> We're ready for that. Yom Kippur. Wonderful. Passover, love to see it. Awesome, great. We've got some folks uh, working on the ground with housing elements. Ash Wednesday. Wonderful, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. Christmas, Halloween. Some folks working on climate action plans in Hayward. Awesome. This is really great to see. Please feel free to keep dropping your introductions in the chat as we get started. Um, warm, warm welcome to everybody. And thanks again for joining. Uh, thanks again for joining from either this working group that you all have maybe been a part of, or thanks for joining for the very first time. Uh, since we do have folks who are new and you are continuing with this group, uh, I wanted to just give a little bit of context about today's dialogue so we can all be on the same page uh, before we, we dive in. So at Build It Green, um, as many of y'all know, we are focusing on the intersection of affordability, social equity, and environmental vitality, specifically in the housing space. And we're really leaning into not sacrificing on any of these goals and values as we move forward. We really believe that we can achieve these uh, goals together if we work together. So that is why we are actually building a network uh, called the uh, Housing System Innovators Network, or Innovators Network for short. And we're hoping to further address climate equity and housing affordability crises together by working with folks across the housing ecosystem. As you saw in the chat already, we have a bunch of different folks in our network, uh, folks who work at nonprofits, folks who work at governmental agencies, and also in the private sector. Together, we see all of these systemic issues from a diversity of angles and create a greater opportunity to have new approaches and new impacts with the entire system in mind. This particular dialogue comes out of our policy working group that we've had this year that's at a pivot point. This is our last official meeting in the working group's current form. So as the policy, as, a, as an accelerant working group, this is the last one. I know, sad, uh, but not the end of our work together by any means. Uh, we've done a lot together so far this year, and that has really helped us hone in on Bay Area housing elements as a potential area of opportunity for cross-sector work. So today we're looking at a potential path forward or multiple potential paths forward through suggestions primarily created by Alex Schaffron of Schaffron Strategies, and some of Build It Green's staff. We'll also be hearing from Con Rousseau of San Francisco Foundation, 
Janae Aubrey of the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California, or NPH, and Sam Temperman Gilfont from Public Advocates. They've gotten a preview of the suggested work areas uh, that Alex has been designing for us and have agreed to help kick off our conversation by sharing some of their thoughts. So thank you very much for, for that work ahead of time to help this be a successful conversation. We'll then be opening up to hear all of your thoughts. Everybody on this call, we hope will engage in one of the ways that we have for you today, whether that's in the chat, in the digital whiteboard space called Mural that we will be sharing later on, and or verbally. We are going to have a pretty significant chunk of time uh, in the latter half of this session to have that verbal conversation. Uh, so please uh, do join us for that since y'all are here. Now, a couple of caveats. We don't anticipate uh, that we will be able to, as Build It Green staff, own all these work streams, all the wonderful ideas that come today, come up today. We also don't expect to have a fully solidified 19 point plan on what we're going to do coming out of this. That would be a lot to ask for just one short session. Uh, but we do hope to have some jumping off points for where we could go as a network. And we also hope to gauge the energy, the honest energy that this group has uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, to work together as a network on this work stream around housing elements that we're going to co-create together. Uh, from now until the end of the year, Build It Green is wrapping up not only this working group, but all of our other working groups in their current form. And we're hosting similar dialogues and events to help us figure out what we're going to be doing together as a network in 2023. So do stay tuned and uh, stay engaged, help us shape uh, that path forward. Apologies if you can hear my, my dog. There was a, a neighbor, so, <laughs> so scary. All right, uh, with all that context in mind, let's let Alex have the floor. Uh, Alex, would you please introduce yourself to the group and also talk to us about the suggested work areas you've been planning for us? Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Lara and, and Jeremy and, and Build a Green uh, and everybody here for having me and giving me this opportunity to, uh, I guess, be the provo provocateur is the official uh, title. Now that I you zoom in on me on the Zoom, the mustache does look really ridiculous. So I guess it's sort of fitting for the like provocateur. Hopefully next time you see me, I will look more sane. Um, so thank you all again. I just wanted to provide a little very quick context and then I'll sit back and I'm excited to listen and engage and talk to folks. People are willing to to chat at me and talk to me anytime and obviously willing to, you know, welcome to emailing me. I, you know, I think like a lot of you, I think about this stuff all day, every day. And um, this is what I do. And I'm just happy to engage uh, offline about any of these conversations. So when, when we started sitting down and thinking about this conversation and where this group could go and what is the housing element opportunity, um, we started with a uh, again some criteria that you see on your on the on the on the one pager right we wanted to make something that, sure that had impact had ability to have impact at scale um, that wasn't sort of choosing between affordability equity environmental goals but able to kind of weave all those things together uh, and and that there was it really able to channel the energy um, and support that existed already to a certain extent um, and then in particular kind of played on the work already being done by all of you individually in this network and in your individual organizations, trying to be really conscious of what everybody is doing. Um, and particularly for me, I think one of the things that I've emphasized um, with Build It Green is thinking about you know their traditional members, um, folks in the green building industry. I thought a lot about Janae and NPH and, and your members as the, the builders. And so how do we take advantage of these the membership organizations uh, that were part of it. And this is before Sam uh, came on and I hadn't been thinking as much about sort of tenant organizing and I see Peter now on the on the list as well. And so I think, um, as but that is the context, right? Who, what, what are the things that people are doing? How can we take advantage of the existing members? Um, the other context that for me is really important and I wanna emphasize this, and I think maybe I'm a, a little bit different from some of the other folks in the housing space in this is that I don't see the housing element opportunity 
as being the thing that is sort of defined by HCD or by current state politics around the housing element. I do think that that's important. Um, some of you may notice, and I think Khan noticed, and Sam noticed to a certain extent in reading this, that there was maybe an absence of that um, kind of the enforcement side of the housing element process or of like real focus on, you know, the, the sites and the zoning and all the things that we know are central to the housing element processes is currently understood. Uh, to me, that's not the entirety of the opportunity that housing elements present. Um, and I feel like as a strategist, it was important for me to challenge the group to, to define the opportunity based on the needs and the possibilities in California housing and not entirely based on the official process that is housing element. Right? Any idea that it impacts housing can and if it's good should go in any jurisdiction's housing element. I know that I encourage my clients and the organizations where I'm a member to sort of think beyond what they think HCD wants or what they think AFFH mandates and do the things that they think that are necessary. All right. And this again can be things like changing the development industry. It could be things like rent regulation, neither of which will necessarily get you points uh, in the calculation. Uh, and again, not that this is not a good approach, but I just thought it, I, it was really important to me in the framing and the context to just to make a plea to, to, to think about the full width and breadth of that as possible using the housing element as an opportunity, as opposed to responding to the official mandate from the state. And again, I think that might put me somewhat differently. I think it's a very much of a both and kind of question. Um, and so again, I do think that there's probably some big missing uh, gaps here, which I'll mention in a second, uh, but that I wanted people to understand that context. Um, I also wanted to make sure that we were able to take advantage of the networks that we have and do things that were really able to affect the building of housing on the ground. Um, and so that's where you get the two pieces and I'll explain them very briefly. And then I wanna sort of make sure that I flag quickly. And again, really thanks to Sam and to Khan who weighed in a little bit earlier and both helped me clarify sort of, I think what, how I was seeing what I had said, um, but also I think some of the key absences. So you'll see two ideas out there um, that came from a kind of cold down list that we, from an initial brainstorm that we had done. One is to really lean in and focus on BAFA, the Regional Housing Finance Agency. Uh, and again, to me, this is a kind of perfect example of using the housing element opportunity for the way that we need to use it, as opposed to sort of responding formally to the prompt and to the boxes that have to be checked from, from Sacramento. Um, if you've read my writing about this, I, you know that one of the things I think about with, in terms of housing element is that this is a really key opportunity for BAFA should be mentioned in everybody's housing element and housing elements should talk about how they're gonna support and build up BAFA. And BAFA needs to be, I think, a key focus in this space and it's not currently. Um, and so that's why that's one of the reasons why, again, I, I, I use this. It's also something that has to do with finance. I just think housing finance is such a central part of what makes things possible. Uh, Con's organization and Partnership for Bay Future, and many of you have been involved in kind of attempts to reform housing finance, and BAFA is something that many of you have already supported. So that was sort of the logic of choosing that. Um, and then again, in that bucket, I think you will see a lot of different ways and approaches and things that you could do to focus on it. But that was the logic for the choice of BAFA. Then the second logic around commercial land redevelopment is really to choose something that had to do directly with developers and development, um, something that could bring together Build a Greens membership that are involved in the building industry and PH's membership that are involved in the development industry and various other of you who are connected to actually building to the performers, to the building trades, to all the things that have to happen on the ground to build housing. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, again, I, you, we, you could, we could theoretically focus on all of the opportunity sites. I just think that there is a, a, a need to focus in some particular way. Um, I happen to think that commercial land, uh, whether it's AB 2011 or SB 6 or other kind of, there's a, a new fund, for instance, for adaptive use. I think this is the most interesting and place as a way of kind of focusing, but there's a lot of other ways that you could focus. So if this is the building builders, box. Um, I think you could you could focus it around a select group of cities. For instance, San Francisco Foundation has already chosen 13 cities, I think, that have the highest arena allocation. So you could choose that. We could choose a particular type of mid-sized cities. I was on a call today earlier with uh, San Francisco Foundation folks around Marin County and San Rafael as a particular key opportunity site, these mid-sized cities. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you could sort of focus this development energy. Um, but that's the sort of development box. 
I would also say, and again, I'm, on reflection, I think that there's probably a missing third box. Uh, so if BAFA is the, is the bankers, it's the finance, it's the money, if the commercial land redevelopment is really the sort of the builders, the sites, what's missing in many ways are the, the, is the legal side, the policy side, um, or as I like to think of it, the lawyers. You could also think of it as a, as a, in a 3P framework of production and preservation and, and the, the lack of a sort of protection measure, right? There's everything that you see on here is very much production preservation focused. Um, I prefer builders, bankers, and lawyers because I feel like that's actually a more accurate way of describing in some ways how things operate. But I would like to propose, and again, this is as much, I'm stealing Khan and Sam's thunder a little bit, appreciate you both the critical feedback, but just to get us going a little farther down the road, I think it's clear that there's kind of a missing box. And so that in some ways, I think, I, want, I felt like it was useful to leave that as a question for all of you. And now it's a chance to kind of get everybody's feedback and thought, you know, again, is that a missing box? Should it replace one of these other boxes? There are also ways that you could combine them. Again, if you chose a, a select group of cities and you decide to work on, again, both sites and other kinds of enforcement mechanisms, um, that would be a possibility. The one thing, and again, and this is where I'll leave it, in the, within the mindset of sort of thinking taking advantage and built and bending the housing element opportunity to the needs of the housing community as opposed to the other way around. I would encourage folks, if there is a desire to work on something that is more policy oriented, that is, that is to think again, one, the one possibility would be something to work directly around enforcement, um, you know, to support our old friend, David Zisser and this kind of space. But I do think things, for instance, like supporting campaigns for rent regulation and rent control, which I think will be one of the most active and already one of the most active and exciting spaces in the region, isn't sort of formally on anybody's radar as an official thing that one is meant to do in the housing element. But if I had to start a housing element from scratch, this would be the first line in my housing element is, is if you don't have rent control, get it. Um, and so again, I would encourage folks, if we're going to add that extra category, to make sure to think beyond um, what the checklist is coming from Sacramento. Again, not that that's not important. And if you do decide to go that way, I think it's really great, but I want to make sure that folks are making that decision with the full range of strategic possibilities that are available uh, and, and not just sort of how, how folks, I think sometimes think housing elements are meant to be. Um, that's a very rapid fire set of context about sort of how and why we got to this point. Um, larger, I mean, anybody's happy to answer any questions, but, um, and again, you're also welcome to chat at me in any form, um, especially in the latter part of the day after uh, after Janae and Sam and Khan have had a chance to speak. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, all the work you put into this outline. I really appreciate that you have this uh, very much horizontal uh, perspective on the housing ecosystem and thinking about all these different pieces and how we could all potentially uh, work together. Uh, across sectors. So so thank you so much for uh, getting us kicked off there. I know it's not an easy role to like come in with a with a, some suggestions knowing that, you know, people may take it or leave it or want to pick it apart. So thank you so much for playing that role for us today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to hear uh, from three different folks uh, from different areas of this work. Um, and just give us started thinking. We're really just trying to to warm up to the full group conversation. And so again, th thank you to our conversation catalyzers, as we're calling them, uh, who've agreed to help us get started. I was hoping, uh, Janae, would you uh, like to go first and just spend a couple minutes sharing with us? Sure, happy to do that and introduce myself first. Um, I'm Janae Aubrey, she, her pronouns. I'm the senior policy manager at MPH, so I focus on our local and regional work. And I've had the um, pleasure of working on the housing elements and messaging um, project that we've been doing um, in coordination with my communications team, where we built out some messaging guides and some capacity building training for advocates, our, our partners and our members to help increase community engagement in the housing element process. So like just educating, like, what is it? Why is it important? Um, expressing the urgency. And I've been happy to attend some of Sam's um, housing element working group meetings and, and have conversations with Khan about the work that he's been doing as well. So it's nice for all of us to be together in this space. And it seems like perfect timing for this conversation. So I mentioned the messaging project, but now MPH is also thinking about an ad campaign, particularly with um, five of our sub-regional partners, EPO, HLC, um, Choo Choo, 
um, SV at home and generation housing, for example. And we are trying to think of like, okay, is there a regional like message that will um, kind of unite and like elevate the housing element um, process? Is it something that we can all do collectively? Um, so we're in the middle of that conversation and working through it. So it's really helpful to have Alex like provide that context and to have this one pager to look at as things that maybe we can kind of hone in and target in this ad campaign. And I'm also thinking like, I really appreciate Alex, your invitation to think more broadly about the housing element. I think we've been trying to get our members to do the same. We very much believe like, okay, yes, the messaging and the ad campaigns, they may be specifically tied to the housing element, but we're trying to build that muscle and that capacity for the long-term, right? For, for the campaign in 2024 that I think we'll talk a little bit more about and for just like continuing our housing policy um, advocacy, because of course, like that advocacy will not just start and end with the housing element, but the formal process, it's gonna continue for as long as it needs to continue. So I really appreciate that invitation and that like lens. And I'm thinking about that too, with these two examples of focusing on the commercial land redevelopment and then BAFA as well. So I do wanna say that I've heard folks like staff at BAFA, the BAFA director talk about maybe having a pilot or, or raising funding specifically for commercial land redevelopment. So I think that there's some synergy there. Um, and I'm also thinking about BAFA's they have about four or five different pilot projects and is focused not just on financing, but also preservation and protection. Um, so I'm hearing Conan and um, Sam's um, emphasis on like, okay, what about the policy? What about enforcement? And I think that very much can be a conversation with BAFA as well. And we can take advantage of all of the pilot programs in doing so. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Awesome. That was uh, really great to get us started. I, I love how you're already starting to weave things together. This is perfect for, for this conversation. So definitely uh, keep up with that. Um, Khan, would you like to introduce yourself and, and share next? Yeah, thank you, Lara. My name is, again, Khan Russo with the San Francisco Foundation. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Innovation. And I really appreciated being provoked. And it gave me a lot to think about these last couple of days. Um, again, I'm really honored to share the space with you all and really echo Janai's sentiment and have so much gratitude for her and Sam's leadership and expertise in this space. I too have been attending Sam's training. So uh, you're gonna, uh, you're in really good hands with him. Um, I also want to note that um, also joining us today is Elisa Arona, who has started as the senior director for the partnership for the Bay's Future and Great Communities Collaborative. She'll be taking on a lot of the responsibilities and roles that I had played before. So a couple of ideas that um, this prompted me to think about. On the commercial land redevelopment side, you know, I think for me, it may it provided more clarity and more confidence in saying that we don't have the right fan financing tools and incentives to really take advantage of this new law currently, right? Um, we need more flexibility. And I wonder how we can leverage corporate treasury to really secure and guarantee these loans or use corporate charge treasury that don't require a big return to underwrite um, or guarantee innovations in these types of development. Um, I also want, it made me think about, you know, what are the plug and play solutions that are out there for these types of commercial corridor and land? And how do we consider rehabilitation and refurbishing versus tear down and building more density? And I think that in a lot of these commercial corridors, um, it might not necessarily be zoned for the height that sometimes um, can be possible. Um, I have also concerns about the impact of these to local revenue and tax taxes, right? Like um, in San Jose, for a very long time, they fiercely protected their commercial land because they wanted to make sure that they preserve that for corporations or future opportunities with corporations who can then um, uh, come to San Jose. Um, we know that commercial spaces generate more taxes um, and residential spaces cost more for, because of ongoing costs such as libraries and fire stations and parks. And then I think for us as a group, um, for the big network, um, I think for us, I really think about <clears throat> how can we grow more black and brown and women developers and provide more technical assistance so that they can be leading and they can be developing in this space. On the BAFA front, a couple of things. Um, you know, I think for me, uh, thinking about uh, the BAFA, you know, um, bond effort in particular, and uh, um, I wonder how we can leverage other bond efforts that will be happening at the local level in the next couple of years, and how to make sure that those local levels aren't compromising the BAFA effort. Um, I think further, I think about how it can complement 
you know, the, the statewide effort to do the constitutional amendment and lower the bond threshold for affordable housing to a simple majority. Um, you know, I think as BAFA is doing its pilot, one of the questions that, um, or one of the things that um, the San Francisco Foundation is really focused on is to make sure that these pilots are really centered in racial equity and that uh, BAFA is being developed and designed um, and the programs is provided is really centered in racial equity. Um, we think that ABAG and MTC has done a great job of providing uh, resources and technical assistance to the city. I've uh, heard many times that the city aren't kind of, uh, it's not for a lack of having resources to do the housing elements or to produce the housing elements to produce policy, um, but they don't have the staff to absorb you know, the work and they don't have the expertise, particularly small cities. So I wonder you know, how the big network can help design the pilots to ensure that it continues to be centered in equity and like that then really becomes the example for how BAFA is designed and developed. And I think the big network can ever also partner with cities to take advantage of the resources and help them develop and implement these programs. And lastly, I think um, Alex, you've already kind of alluded to this, but you know, at the as I mentioned, I help lead our policy and innovation work at the San Francisco Foundation. So policy and advocacy and enforcement are really key to us. And like for the first time um, in Rena's history, which started I, uh, the regional housing needs assessment history, which started in '69, and we actually have a law that allows us to really enforce and provide penalties for jurisdictions that do not uh, meet their goals. But how do we do that? What are the types of tools that are necessary? What is the data and information that is necessary to help support advocates in tracking and bringing transparency and advocating for the development of housing in their community? You know, I think at the San Francisco Foundation, um, we have a list of targeted cities that we are really trying to monitor and closely, uh, that we are closely monitoring, right? And these are the cities that have gotten the largest allocations for build for um, housing production. These are cities that have uh, traditionally been exclusionary. These are cities that have large members of their community who have traditionally been discriminated against or redlined. Um, and these are cities that either don't have the staff capacity because their housing department is like two people, right? And there's 60,000 to 100,000 people in their community or we're focusing on target cities that can be really catalytic and can really influence others in the sector. So, um, you know, uh, I'm excited about this and what we can do together. And I really uh, have so much gratitude for the opportunity to share some of my initial thoughts here. Um, and I'll put the link to the housing readiness tool in the chat. This is a tool that the San Francisco Foundation helped to support um, to help with some of the initial community engagement in the housing element process. Thanks for that, Khan, uh, for sharing your research as well as those awesome thoughts. I uh, am really glad we're we're getting in these these lenses of how to continue being intersectional and, and what does it mean to keep uh, in whatever direction we end up going, keep bringing in that equity lens, that sustainability lens, the affordability lens. So uh, thank you so much for continuing to bring that in. I do hope everybody who's listening is taking notes for any uh for yourself, because this is all such rich information so far, but also uh, so that we can get into the conversation uh, soon here and uh, hear from everybody. But first, uh, we also have uh, Sam to share with us. So Sam, would you um, like to introduce yourself and share with, do we, uh, sorry, yeah. and not Sam, we're gonna Sam <laughs> Temperman Galfant, you ready? I am. Um, Hello, everyone. I am Sam Tepperman Gelfand. I'm a managing attorney at Public Advocates. Um, and it is, I use him pronouns. It's really great to be in this room with Janae and Khan and Alex and Peter and other folks that I've worked with for so many years. Um, and yeah, I guess I would say, you know, we are a legal organization and have done a lot of enforcement work. Um, the housing element actually has been enforceable before this time. Um, but it's more enforceable now. Um, but I actually feel like um, the opportunity that I see or, um, around the housing element this time is that I think there's gonna be a lot better plans. And so I guess I have a little bit less focus for this group on enforcement um, 
the side of things and more on the implementation side. And I think um, first and foremost, uh, there's a new affirmatively furthering fair housing requirement in housing elements. So that means that there's gonna be good data analysis and studies of what the local disparities are for people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, other protected classes. And, you know, HCD I think is doing a pretty good job of overseeing this to make sure that jurisdictions are actually looking at local equity issues and racial justice issues, um, prioritizing actions around those issues and coming up with um, concrete steps that they're going to take. So I guess I would just urge that any sort of action that this group takes has that fair housing overlay to it, because I think that that's something that needs to infuse both the housing elements and also everything that the jurisdiction, all local jurisdictions are doing around housing policy uh, and land use. Um, and then the other big opportunity that I see, which maybe points in a different direction than commercial sites is that, you know, hopefully every local jurisdiction is going through a pretty in-depth local planning process right now, um, engaging all different economic segments of the community, looking at segregation, looking at displacement, um, and coming up with a set of sites and a set of action plans that are responsive to those local conditions. And so, um, you know, there are certainly some bad actors out there. There are certainly some folks that have not enough capacity to do the most robust job, but I think that there are a lot of cities that are really going to do this local planning and that we have a state housing agency that's actually staffed up and um, has the political backing to make sure that there are good plans being adopted. So I guess when I, I love the idea of focusing on getting projects actually built that can demonstrate that we can have in physical real reality um, projects that advance um, equity, advance environmental goals, advance community goals, like I think that's great. And from talking to Jeremy about the configuration of this group, I think there's a really great intersection of folks that could come together to make those projects real. Um, but I guess I would urge a focus on sites identified by jurisdictions in the housing elements, um, particularly sites that are going to advance fair housing goals, um, whether that is affordable housing and gentrifying neighborhoods to help stem the tide of displacement, or whether it's affordable housing and mixed income housing in high opportunity areas that is going to promote integration and access to opportunity. So I think, and I, my argument for that would be that, you know, those are the sites where there's local momentum and where jurisdictions have gone through a process said, we want to develop here, we can develop here, and this is gonna further multiple community goals. Um, and, and, you know, that's carrying forward the momentum of the housing alone process, I think. Whereas I think, um, you know, on commercial sites, there might be opportunities there. There are certainly challenges there, but um, I think there's also a lot of dangers of small business displacement or loss of local tax revenue, or maybe, you know, proximity to polluting industrial uses. I think it gets much more complicated and hopefully there's um, work that's been done in the housing element to come up with good sites um, under the, you know, within the parameters set by statute, which are much more robust now than they have been before. Um, and then, you know, the other piece on implementation is that I think there are going to be good programs in selected cities to, you know, revise their zoning code or to create a local affordable housing funding source or to advance a tenant anti-harassment policy. So I think those are going to be commitments that I think we're going to see in housing elements that are pushing the envelope, whether they're because of local advocacy or affirmatively furthering fair housing obligations. Um, and I think that jurisdictions are going to need support to do that in a really robust and effective way. So I think that's another place where I see opportunity. Totally agree with Alex that like the housing element is not, I don't see that as a constraint on good housing policymaking and good housing advocacy, but I guess within the, but I also see that starting this work off in 2023, that I think there's going to be a lot of really good local momentum in a lot of good, in a lot of cities for good developments on an individual site basis and for good policy. And it feels like there's a particular opportunity at this moment to sort of seize that momentum and make things that are, you know, a good idea on paper and a community has come up with into reality that's actually gonna get people housing and keep people in their homes. 
Thanks so much for sharing, Sam. And I, I appreciate your uh, call out of folks who are really doing their, their darndest and, and best work uh, here and, and uh, thinking about how we can work with those those folks, those cities, uh, those organizations, HCD, and in the, the positive efforts that they're doing as um, well as make change to the larger systemic issues. Um, and I appreciate the, the nuance that you're adding here around uh, commercial sites and, and just the acknowledgement that they can't just be any site that we have to think about displacement of businesses as well as uh, individuals in their homes. So very much uh, appreciative of all four of you. Thank you so much for getting us kicked off. Um, we are now going to move into the discussion portion of this dialogue. Um, so we'll get ready, everybody. <laughs> I bet you all are sitting on some wonderful thoughts. So very excited to start hearing those. Um, in order to get more folks uh, participating today, we do have a fairly large group. Uh, we have decided to do just a quick 10 minute breakouts uh, with four or five folks in each one so that you get a chance to bounce some ideas off folks before you uh, might want to share with the whole group. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we are going to have a few different ways to engage. We know not everybody likes to participate in the same way. So of course, we have the chat available. Um, and our, our guests can also be responding in the chat as well as Builder Green staff uh, to keep conversation going. Uh, we are going to be dropping in, or Jenny, uh, my colleague, is going to be dropping in a link to a mural board. It's just a digital whiteboard space. If you're not familiar with the tool, you can totally feel free not to use it. That's fine. Uh, but if you do want to use it, there's a uh, instruction section in the, the upper left hand corner of the mural uh, so you could get oriented if you'd like to. Um, we also have, um, of course, the verbal discussion. So in your breakouts, you can get started chatting as well as with the full group. All right. Um, are there any clarification questions before we jump into breakout groups? Seeing none, uh, Jenny, would you like to put us in those groups, please? All right. I think everybody's back in the room. Uh, welcome back. Uh, hopefully you all are feeling a bit more uh, warmed up uh, thanks to those small group chats. Uh, we are going to be opening up to full group discussion here. Now, we, we don't expect that we'll get an opportunity to hear share outs from every group. We're not going to require you to do that. Um, but if there is something you're really excited about that came up in the group, please do feel free to jump in um, and talk about it here. Um, if uh, there's something you want to put in the mural, please feel free to do so. Hopefully we have the right link out there now. Please do drop in the chat if, if you're having trouble accessing. Um, and then uh, also feel free to mention anything that hasn't come up so far. Um, and we can just riff off each other. If there does get to be a bunch of people trying to speak at once, we can use the raise your hand function of Zoom. But otherwise, uh, feel free to kind of self-moderate and uh, jump in whenever you feel it is appropriate. You have something to say. I can share Eric's thought right before he left if no one wants to jump in. <laughs> okay, so Eric Callery from Change Lab, he had to <clears throat> jump off um, for a two o'clock meeting. So I caught him on the way out and sorry if my throat is hoarse. So thoughts, parting thoughts he shared was that he heard um, across the conversations a nexus around community engagement and how like the housing element is much better with the new legislation, but with the equity perspective, the engagement needs to be like broader and more inclusive, um, but it's like limited due to just like the time constraints of the housing elements as well as site selection and how, again, community engagement like kind of like rose to the top and interconnected across the conversations you heard. And just repeating that I'm a messenger, so I'm hoping I convey all of this correctly. Um, other things he shared was like, specific actions he's thinking that could go forward, um, maybe fall into the realm of the site selection um, element itself, um, the quality of the housing element, and how there's limited staff capacity and how limited staff capacity impacts um, inclusive community engagement that they can like build out. Um, also, he touched upon financing and how that's course historically and structurally restricted. Um, 
and that he doesn't know as much about Bosna, but I feel that that could be leverage. So those are thoughts to drop into the buckets. Um, uh, Laura, I, I want to maybe provoke some people who were provocative themselves. Uh, so, you know, my group was uh, Zoe, uh, Kenneth, and Peter. And there were two really interesting things that jumped out. I think the first was this, uh, an idea around and it builds off of like what Sam said and a, you know, kind of a few others said in the earlier part of um, there's going to be a lot of good plans out there. Um, and so the, the challenge is, um, you know, implementation and can we um, really work with some jurisdictions to uh, do implementation in kind of a new visionary way that is, you know, kind of consistent with our goals around, um, you know, equity, uh, environment, and um, and affordability. Um, and so the question I have is like, you know, what might be those cities and who are the ones that I think are both on, like, say, the San Francisco Foundation uh, list of 13 and um, uh, the ones that are going to be more ambitious. Um, and then the second one was a question, which I think we kind of took the, the BAFA piece and kind of blew that out a bit and thought about, well, what are the ways that we don't just get, um, you know, first of all, BAFA funded, but then, um, you know, there's all these other kind of pots of funding out there that can we leverage those in ways that is, um, uh, you know, probably more helpful than kind of some of the, you know, kind of the stacking work that has been necessary for, um, you know, affordable housing for years and years and years, um, so that we're really, you know, kind of mobilizing lots of different funding sources, um, you know, to achieve what we're what we're after. So, you know, those jumped out at me in the the discussion. But you know, again, Zoe, Kenneth, Peter, anything that that you want to add in, you you said it more all of that stuff more eloquently than I did. I might just add, this is Peter. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, it was a quick but good discussion, um, the four of us. And, you know, this idea of, of doing bold things, um, using the ideas in the housing element process, which can be very aspirational, but thinking how can you actually achieve some of them? Um, I, anyway, really like the idea that Alex laid out of uh, a kind of focusing on commercial lands, because I think that creates in a post COVID world. Uh, a real opportunity landscape. It's kind of a blank canvas in some respects because all of that has to be rethought. Um, and so there's a lot of, I would assume a lot of motivation and hunger both on the landowner side, but also on jurisdictions. And secondly, if there's new creative institutions for uh, harnessing and allocating funding beyond what we're used to, then um, that starts to be the juice that, that helps the creativity and the motivation happen at the local level. I, I, I firmly don't believe in just browbeating cities. I don't think the whole accountability emphasis gets you anywhere other than a lot of defensiveness, but I, uh, I'm Pollyannish in the sense that I think there are lots of jurisdictions in California where there's political and bureaucratic leadership that wants to do interesting, bold, and innovative things. And having uh, access to land, commercial land possibly, and some new funding sources uh, could be the uh, formula that really kind of gets some action. You know, one of the things that this is prompting me to think is what is the kind of base building and power building work that we need to do in the respective kind of cities that um, we're targeting, right? And I think of the work that the Partnership for the Base Future does, as well as the Great Community Collaboration does in making sure that there's the connective tissue between our key advocate partners so that we can kind of move at the speed of trust and that we are um, we have the relationships in place already so that we can activate, right? So it's, um, it's gonna require that type of work now um, and trying to figure out who would be in the advocacy space in the target jurisdictions. And then how do we connect them to each other um, with a shared goal and agenda? Well, and I do think, Con, you know, just thinking about that and then adding on, going back to some of the stuff that Alex was saying, you know, through, uh, you know, where is that, um, you know, capacity 
uh, you know, where does it already lie or where is it growing? And then, you know, where we have also connections to builders and developers, um, uh, you know, can we essentially marry up that capacity um, that is, um, you know, kind of essentially build the brains, the, um, you know, the, the, the literal know-how of how to build with that robust community um, uh, uh, leadership and, you know, and if there is a local government um, that has the, um, you know, the, the, the wisdom to be innovative and creative, it's like that, that becomes this like, uh, you know, kind of triad that, um, you know, creates opportunities for like, you know, really amazing things that may, um, uh, you know, ultimately prompt lots of other communities to, um, uh, to follow an example. So, you know, that, that's kind of emerging in my head as something exciting I'm going to make a really annoying philanthropy-esque comment right now. So please check me for saying this, but, you know, um, the how do we identify those kind of best practices and how do we create opportunities to kind of share those best practices um, as people are coming up with different strategies um, and what role can and should philanthropy playing and help to support those efforts, I guess, is my kind of question. What have you seen work, right? Like, uh, we publish toolkits all the time, but getting jurisdictions to actually read it and implement it and incorporate it into their um, draft policies um, doesn't actually happen at the rate that we think it does, right? Or I think that I put in all this money, I pay a consultant, right? We gather all the best practices, we put out this pretty report, we hold an event and have a panel, and then we're like done, right? So like what more and what should we be doing? What is it that our partners and advocates need in order for us to get to that point where the best practices are being developed or what type of support do our um, jurisdictions or our city employees need um, to better absorb and take the best practices? Nikki, go ahead and jump in if you'd like. And I have an idea. Uh, typically, money talks. So from a philanthropy standpoint, as jurisdictions, municipalities look for funding, maybe part of their application process is how, how have they engaged with some of these toolkits? How have they, you know, attended meetings or whatever those things are that you feel could be valuable? And it could be the same for organizations like ours that, you know, if we are identifying a problem and you are in the philanthropy is creating a solution, maybe through the application process, it doesn't have to be a deal breaker, but it could be a highlight that there is an expectation that you're using resources and tools that are being provided to possibly help solve some of the things that, you know, we are all coming to philanthropy for. It's really helpful. Thank you, Nikki. I I thought maybe I also just jump in and actually this is a reflection conversation that that Sam Rubin and I had and others on our little breakout. Uh, and another thing, I, I, maybe a piece of context about another thing I didn't do in this framing was is that I think we were all having experiences on the ground kind of frustrated with what's happening. Um, and I will say this as a consultant, I think Sam and I reflected on this. I mean, I think one of the hugest weaknesses in this process that maybe we didn't identify is I, I, I think it's been a poor, I think the city, local cities are trying to do what they can. I think our, my fellow consultants have largely not done amazing work in the elements that I have seen. And I don't actually, it's not just them, they're, they're also caught in a consultant industrial complex that isn't helpful, it isn't productive. And so I, I was writing a piece about housing element strategy on my Substack a few weeks ago, and it took every ounce of self-restraint to like not write entirely about this frustration and what we need to do differently. Mm -hmm. 
partly because I wanted to, you know, stay positive, talk about what we can still do. This process is, you know, close to being done. It's not going to be helpful to throw everybody under the bus that we still need to do things. But I think Con, especially, I think, not necessarily for this group, but I think thinking long term, um, I don't think we can go into the next cycle with the same kind of plans. And I think we really have to sort of make sure that we're able to convince HCD and state government to kind of short circuit a little bit the kind of way the planning is currently done now and see if we can, in 2025, put a plan in place to do the 2030 plans differently. I just can't. As long as cities are buying, you know, hiring people for millions of dollars to try to produce compliant plans, I don't think we're ever going to get the kind of really creative and aggressive housing policies that we kind of need. So, but I didn't. Now, Alex, I mean, I completely agree with you, yeah. right? Like all the big cities hired all of the very experienced um, planning consultants, right? And then it created this huge void for all of you know, the smaller cities. Um, and then like they were hiring folks, you know, right out of graduate studies for, you know, um, planning um, and they didn't have the expertise, but MTC ABAG stepped up, um, provided tons of technical assistance and cash, but we literally didn't have the pipeline of uh, expertise, right? And those folks were not equity centered. Right? So then it kind of compounds this, need, especially as we think about, Sam, what you just talked about regarding the need to really center the AFFH or the fair housing components, you know, to this work. So it became a total cluster, right? And um, the cities, it wasn't even for the cities not having the money or the resources or the checklist. They just literally didn't have the capacity to even like absorb it. So they were looking for plug and play solutions also. Um, and then we couldn't step up quick enough to provide those kind of plug and play solutions. Yeah. So, I mean, I, um, I've been asked to be an AFFH consultant for <laughs> one jurisdiction. I'm like, this is now a thing too. Uh, yeah. And so you're gonna have somebody separate that's gonna help you and, you know, and I told them, I'm like, you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm not selling AFFH compliance. I'll help you, but like, I'm not gonna help you comply. I'll help you actually affirmatively further have fair housing, but yeah. I think that's one of the hard things, right, is how we channel what we've learned and the frustrations in this space into the future while still being able to act within the, okay, we're, you know, we're wherever we are in this process. Can't change the consultants now. <laughs> like, uh, a big... like from a pipeline perspective, right, Alex, that's what we have to start that now. Like yeah. for them to become experts by 2030, we need to like create the pipeline now. I mean, might there be an opportunity for outside groups to start trainings for housing element consultants, like groups like Gimby, like Build a Green, others who have kind of an equity and a housing innovation focus um, to, to begin to create that pipeline. Because uh, otherwise, yeah, we have to go through a policy route and completely reconfigure how housing elements are done at the state level, from the state level down. Um, but in the near term, what might it look like to actually start training that pipeline so that people have those skills and that community, like smaller communities, especially who can't necessarily afford or may not be at the front of the line for the, the premier consultants have access to, to high quality individuals who can really help them uh, bring about change and, uh, and to do it, do it well. Um, this is Joanna with uh, Urban Environmentalists and we are a part of UMB Action and I'll just chime in to say that sounds great. Um, we have folks who are in, you know, volunteers, grassroots level, who are in cities across California, who love to uh, dive into the details. And I think we can certainly be much more effective if we are working um, with uh, cities on uh, from the get-go, rather than uh, complaining afterwards that the outcome wasn't what we were hoping for. Uh, so we are always happy to work with anyone uh, on that. I just want to chime in briefly and say, you know, I think I think a big part of this is just this recalcitrance on the part of, um, you know, cities and and you know the the what Alex sort of talked about earlier, the the consultant industrial complex um, to. To really make the changes necessary, um, we we knew from the get go that this cycle was going to be different, and cities and and consultancies just didn't take it seriously, and so I think there is um, certainly now as uh, some cities are starting to get rejection letters or are starting to get decertified, I think there is 
um, somewhat of an acknowledgement that, oh, things, things are changing. This is not business as usual. Um, but not, you know, I, I don't think anyone has had penalties steep enough where um, it has really, you know, kind of scared them into, we need to actually be, um, you know, furthering policies that engender the housing we need. We actually need to be, you know, putting anti-displacement protections uh, into, into our frameworks um, in, in a way that, um, you know, actually, actually accomplishes the goals that we, that we seek out. And so I think there are still opportunities in this cycle, um, especially as the ABAG housing elements start to come in, um, especially as the letters from HCD start to come in saying, no, you didn't do these 15 things. Um, you know, you, you need to do them. Um, I think there is still an opportunity for, for our groups to, um, to weigh in and, essentially say we have provided you um, or are providing you with policies that we believe will will further equity and, and <coughs> further, you know, will help us accomplish these needs. Um, you you need to pay attention. And it's it's going to come down to, I think, whether or not HCD um, will will look at that. But I I'm maybe maybe it's uh, a bit of youthful naivete, but I I, I do think given uh, <coughs> the new blood at HCD that that there's a chance that that happens still the cycle. It, is, is it wrong that I've been thinking about encouraging an outside developer to push something through in Sausalito under SB 35 in order to sort of make people realize what we're dealing with if we choose not to build and not, not to have an acceptable um, housing element? I, I've had the same thought about uh, Hillsborough and Atherton. Like, cause I mean, all it needs is 10% affordability and it's got the ministerial approval. It's uh, so, cause people don't seem to realize that that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, I mean, I think one of the big things that comes up here locally in Sausalito is that, I mean, it, everyone wants Sausalito to be exactly like it was the day they moved in, not the day you moved in or someone else, but the day they moved in. Um, but don't realize that if we just keep saying no, eventually we're not gonna have any say and change is going, cause the one constant is change will happen. The question is, do we want to define it for and be a part of defining it so it fits with what people want locally, or do we just want the state to allow whoever, and then we lose all say? So, and but that that message, like when people hear that, they're like, oh, but then too, not enough people are deep enough and wonky enough to really recognize the, what that mean, actually means and what that could look like. That's so. That's literally, I've been toying with the idea of trying to get someone to do it, um, um, just to just to make people realize what the what we're talking about here. Um, because people seem to still think they can just say no. Uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Peter have one last quick thought and then I'll, I'll share some wrap up uh, context if if that's all right. Yeah, I, I, uh, I just wanted to I, I make kind of a, I guess a bold thought here. Uh, I, I don't think you need housing elements in order to do innovative policy or projects or financing or thinking. Um, you know, those happen with or without housing elements, but I realize that housing elements are there to set up the conditions for those things to happen and to systematize them. So there's an importance to having quality housing elements and having some um, accountability around doing good work. Uh, but that in and of itself doesn't create results. So I think there's two parallel tracks. And um, it's one of the things I liked about the way Alex kind of set up, like what are the practical things it will take for us to get to these outcomes that we're looking for? I, I do think that when you're talking about jurisdictions, especially the smaller ones, um, there's so much energy focused on accountability that I don't think is enough space given or opportunity given for them not to feel simply on the defensive and to actually try to see what innovative ideas might be generated locally. Uh, there is often good leadership at, both at the bureaucratic and political level in jurisdictions. We just uh, need to be able to uh, create spaces for that to be teased out. Uh, so I think having both an accountability focus, but also a collaborative focus, those two things together uh, are really important. Well, thanks everybody for uh, showing up today and for participating, especially uh, again, thanks to Alex, uh, thanks to Khan, Janae, and Sam, uh, who had to drop off the call a little bit early um, for just helping get us started because there's so much here as we can see. Um, if you still have thoughts, um, we would love to continue hearing them. You, the mural board will stay open if you do want to drop thoughts in there. If you really are excited to continue this conversation, want to see Build It Green really 
taking on something in, in this space, uh, please drop your name on the mural board in section four or just in the chat, we'll capture it either way. Um, we would love to know who's who's really excited to keep, keep working on this with us um, and work across sectors. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll also be providing uh, opportunities to give feedback on other potential next steps. This is just kind of one bucket or one area that, that we're looking into for, for next year's work. So stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already, please join the Build It Green newsletter. Um, Jenny is going to be dropping a link in the chat and it's also in the mural board. Again, thank you for your time, attention and participation today. And I hope you all have a great day. Look forward to seeing you real soon. Bye-bye.